Kamala by Hermann Hesse. Siddhartha learned something new at every step along his path, for the world was transformed, and his heart was enchanted. He saw the sun rising over the wooded mountains and setting over the distant palm-lined shore. At night, he saw the stars arranged in the sky and the crescent moon drifting like a boat in the blue. He saw trees, stars, animals, clouds, rainbows, rocks, herbs, flowers, brooks, and rivers, dew glittering on the morning bushes, high and distant mountains, blue and wan. Birds sang and bees, wind wafted silvery in the rice paddy. All this, myriad and motley, had existed always. Sun and moon had been shining always, rivers rushing and bees humming always. But in earlier times, all this had been nothing but a fleeting and deceptive veil in front of Siddhartha's eyes, distrusted, destined to be pierced by thought and destroyed since it was not reality, since reality lay beyond the visible. But now, his liberated eyes remained on this side. He saw and acknowledged visibility. He sought his home in this world, did not seek reality, did not aim at any beyond. Beautiful was the world if you contemplated it like this, with no seeking, so simple, so childlike, beautiful were moon and stars, beautiful were brook and bank, forest and rock, goat and rose beetle, flower and butterfly. It was beautiful and delightful to go through the world like this, so childlike, so awake, so open to what was near, so without distrust. The sun burned his head differently. The forest shade cooled him differently. Brook and cistern tasted differently, as did pumpkin and banana. Short were the days, short the nights. Every hour flew by swiftly, like a sail across the sea. Under the sail, a ship full of treasures, full of joys. Siddhartha saw a tribe of apes wandering through the lofty vault of the forest, high in the branches, and he heard a wild and eager singing. Siddhartha saw a ram pursuing a ewe and mounting her. In a reedy lake, he saw a pike hunting in its evening hunger. The swarms of frightened young fish darting out of the water, flashing and flickering, Strength and passion emanated urgently from the hasty whirlpools created by the ferocious hunter. All this had always existed, and he had never seen it. He had never been present. Now he was there. He belonged to it. Light and shadow ran through his eyes. Star and moon ran through his heart. On the way, Siddhartha also remembered everything he had experienced in the garden of Jedavana. He remembered the teaching he had heard there, the divine Buddha, the parting with Govinda, the conversation with the Sublime One. He remembered his own words, which he had spoken to the Sublime One. He remembered every word, and he was amazed that he had said things he had not yet really known at the time. What he had said to Gautama, his, the Buddha's treasure and secret, were not the teaching, but the ineffable and unteachable that he had once experienced in the hour of his illumination. That was precisely what he was now setting out to experience, what he was now starting to experience. He now had to experience on his own. True, he had long known that his self was Atman, of the same eternal essence as Brahma. But he had never really found that self, because he had tried to catch it in the net of thought. The body was certainly not the self, nor was the self the playing of the senses, but neither was thinking the self, nor the mind, nor the acquired wisdom, nor the acquired art of drawing conclusions and spinning new thoughts from earlier ones. No, even this world of thought was of this world. And it led to no goal if one killed the random ego of the senses while fattening the random ego of thinking and learning. 
both thoughts and senses were pretty things. Beyond them, the ultimate meaning was concealed. Both had to be heard. Both had to be played with. Neither was to be scorned or overrated. And the secret voices of their innermost cores had to be listened to. He wished to strive for nothing but what the voice ordered him to strive for. Stay with nothing but what the voice advised him to stay with. Why had Gautama once in the hour of hours sat under the bow tree where the illumination struck him? He had heard a voice, a voice in his own heart, which ordered him to seek rest under this tree. And he had not preferred castigation, sacrifice, bathing or praying, eating or drinking, sleeping or dreaming. He had obeyed the voice, obeying like that, not external orders, but only the voice. To be ready like that, that was good, that was necessary. Nothing else was necessary. During the night, as he slept in the thatched hut of a ferryman by the river, Siddhartha had a dream. Govinda was standing before him in an ascetic's yellow robe. Govinda looked sad, and sadly he asked, Why did you leave me? Siddhartha then hugged Govinda, wound his arms around him, and as he drew him to his breast and kissed him, it was no longer Govinda. It was a woman, and full breasts welled out from the woman's garment. And Siddhartha lay on her breast and drank. The milk from that breast tasted sweet and strong. It tasted of woman and man, of sun and woods, of creature and flower, of every fruit, of every pleasure. Her milk left him drunk and senseless. When Siddhartha awoke, the pale river was shimmering through the door of the hut, and the dark hooting of an owl sounded deep and melodious in the woods. At the start of the day, Siddhartha asked his host, the ferryman, to ferry him across the river. The ferryman ferried him on his bamboo raft. The broad expanse of water shimmered rosy in the morning glow. This is a beautiful river said Siddhartha to his escort. Yes, said the ferryman, a very beautiful river. I love it more than anything else. I often listen to it. I often look into its eyes. I have always learned from it. One can learn a lot from a river. Thank you, my benefactor, said Siddhartha, when setting foot on the opposite bank. I have no gift as your guest, dear friend, and no fare. I am homeless, a Brahmin son and a Samana. I could tell, said the ferryman, and I expected no fare from you and no gift. You will give me the gift another time. Do you believe that? said Siddhartha cheerfully. Certainly, I have learned that too from the river. Everything comes again. You too, Samana, will come again now. Farewell. May your friendship be my fee. May you remember me when you sacrifice to the gods. Smiling, they parted. Smiling, Siddhartha was delighted with the ferryman's friendship and friendliness. He is like Govinda, he thought, smiling. All the people I meet on my path are like Govinda. All are thankful, although they themselves have the right to be thanked. All are subservient, all want to be friends, like to obey, think little. People are children. Around midday, he passed through a village. Outside the clay huts, children were tumbling around in the streets, playing with seashells and pumpkin seeds, shrieking and scuffling. But they all shyly fled the foreign samana. At the end of the village, the path led across a brook, and a young woman was kneeling at the edge of the brook, washing laundry. When Siddhartha greeted her, she raised her head and smiled up at him. 
he could see the whites flashing in her eyes. She stood up and came over to him. Her moist lips were shimmering beautifully in her young face. She bantered with him, asked whether he had already eaten, and whether it was true that Samana slept alone in the forest at night and were not allowed to have women with them. While talking, she placed her left foot on his right foot and gestured, as a woman does, when she wants to invite a man to have the kind of love, pleasure, that the handbooks call climbing the tree. Siddhartha felt his blood warming, and since he recalled the dream at this instant, he bent down slightly toward the woman and kissed the brown tip of her breast. Looking up, he saw her face smiling and full of desire, and her narrowed eyes pleading with yearning. Siddhartha likewise felt yearning and felt the source of sex moving. But since he had never touched a woman, he hesitated for an instant, though his hands were ready to reach for her. And at that instant, he shuddered upon hearing his innermost voice. And the voice said, No. All magic left the young woman's smiling face. Siddhartha saw nothing more than the moist gaze of a rutting female animal. He amiably stroked her cheek, turned away from the disappointed woman, and nimbly vanished in the bamboo forest. That day, he reached a large town before evening and was overjoyed, for he yearned for people. He had lived in the forest on and on, and the night he had spent in the ferryman's thatched hut was the first time in years that he had had a roof over his head. Outside the town, near a beautiful fenced grove, the wanderer encountered a small train of male and female servants loaded with baskets. In their midst, in an adorned sedan chair carried by four men, sat a woman, the mistress, on red cushions under a colorful sunshade. Siddhartha halted at the entrance to the pleasure grove and watched the procession, saw the servants, the maids, the baskets, saw the sedan, and saw the woman in the sedan, under high-piled black hair, he saw a very clear, very clever, very delicate face, bright red lips, like a freshly broken fig, eyebrows plucked and painted in wide arches, dark eyes clever and alert, a long radiant neck rising from a green and gold gown, bright, resting hands long and slender, with wide gold bracelets on the wrists. Siddhartha saw how beautiful she was, and his heart laughed. He bowed deep when the sedan drew near, and straightening up again, he peered into the bright, sweet face, read the clever, high-vaulted eyes for an instant, breathed a fragrance that he was unfamiliar with. Smiling, the beautiful woman nodded for an instant, and vanished in the grove, and behind her, the servants. So, I come to this town, thought Siddhartha, under a lucky star. He was tempted to enter the grove right away, but he thought better of it, and only now did he realize how the servants and maids had viewed him at the entrance, how scornful, how distrustful, how chilly they had been. I am still a Samana, he thought still an ascetic and beggar. I cannot stay like this. I cannot enter the grove like this. And he laughed. He stopped the very next person he met, inquired about the grove, and asked for that woman's name. And he learned that this was the grove of Kamala, the renowned courtesan, and that aside from the grove, she owned a house in town. Then Siddhartha entered the town, he now had a goal. Pursuing his goal, he let himself be slurped up by the town. He drifted with the current of the streets, halted in squares, rested on stone steps on the river bank. Toward evening, he made friends with a barber's assistant, whom he saw working in the shade of a shop. 
whom he found again when entering a temple of Vishnu, and whom he told the stories of Vishnu and Lakshmi. That night he slept near the boats on the river, and early in the morning, before the first customers came into the shop, he had the barber's assistant shave off his beard, trim and comb his hair, and rub fine oils into it. Then he went to bathe in the river. In the late afternoon, when beautiful Kamala was in her sedan, approaching her grove, Siddhartha stood at the entrance. He bowed and received the courtesan's greeting. He then beckoned to the last servant in the procession and asked him to tell his mistress that a young Brahmin desired to speak with her. After a while, the servant came back, asked the waiting man to follow him, led him silently to a pavilion where Kamala lay on a couch, and the servant left him alone with her. Were you not standing outside yesterday, and did you not greet me? asked Kamala. Yes, indeed. I saw you yesterday and greeted you. But did you not have a beard yesterday and long hair and dust in your hair? You observed carefully. You saw everything. You saw Siddhartha, the Brahmin's son, who left his home to become a Samana, and who was a Samana for three years, but now I have left that path. I have come to this town, and the first person I encountered before even setting foot in the town was you. I have come to tell you this, O Kamala. You are the first woman to whom Siddhartha has spoken without lowering his eyes. Never again will I lower my eyes when I encounter a beautiful woman. Kamala smiled and played with her fan of peacock feathers and asked, and that is all Siddhartha has come to tell me? To tell you this, and to thank you for being so beautiful. And if that does not displease you, Kamala, I would like to ask you to be my friend and teacher, for I know nothing about the art of which you are a mistress. Now Kamala laughed loudly. <sighs> Never, my friend, has a Samana come to me from the forest and wanted to learn from me. Never has a Samana with long hair and in an old tattered loincloth come to me. Many youths come to me, including sons of Brahmins, but they come in beautiful clothes. They come in fine shoes. They have fragrance in their hair and money in their pouches. That you, Samana, is what the youths are like. Come to me. Siddhartha said, I am already starting to learn from you. Yesterday, I also learned from you. I have already removed my beard, combed my hair, rubbed oil into my hair. There is little that I still lack, you excellent lady. Fine clothes, fine shoes, money in my pouch. Listen. Siddhartha has pursued harder goals than such trifles and has attained them. Why should I not attain what I undertook yesterday to be your friend and to learn the joys of love from you? You will see that I learn easily, Kamala. I have learned harder things than what you are to teach me. And so, Siddhartha is not satisfactory to you as he is with oil in his hair but no clothes, no shoes, no money. Laughing, Kamala exclaimed, <laughs> No, my worthy friend, he is not satisfactory. He must have clothes, lovely clothes, and shoes, lovely shoes, and lots of money in his pouch, and gifts for Kamala. Now, do you know, Samana from the forest, have you noted it? I have noted it well, cried Siddhartha. How could I not note what comes from such lips? Your lips are like a freshly broken fig, Kamala. My lips, too, are red and fresh. They will fit yours. You will see. But tell me, beautiful Kamala, do you not fear the Samana from the forest, who has come to learn love? Why should I fear a Samana, a foolish Samana, from the forest who comes from the jackals and does not yet know what a woman is? Oh, but he is strong, the Samana, and he fears nothing. He could force himself upon you, beautiful girl. He could abduct you. 
he could harm you. No, Samana. I do not fear that. Has any Samana or any Brahmin ever feared that someone might come and grab him and rob him of his learning and his piety and his profundity? No, for they are his own, and he gives of them only what he wishes to give. It is the same, exactly the same, with Kamala and with the joys of love. Red and beautiful are Kamala's lips, but try to kiss them against Kamala's will and you will not get a drop of sweetness from the lips that know how to give so much sweetness. You learn easily, Siddhartha, then learn this too. One can get love by begging, by buying, by receiving it as a gift, by finding it in the street, but one cannot steal it. You have hit on the wrong way, no, it would be too bad if a handsome youth like you were to tackle it so wrongly. Siddhartha bowed, smiling. It would be too bad, Kamala. You are so right. It would really be too bad. No, not a drop of sweetness will be lost for me from your lips or for you from mine. So, it is settled. Siddhartha will come back when he has what he is lacking. Clothes, shoes, money. But listen, sweet Kamala, can you give me a bit more advice? Advice? Why not? Who would not gladly give advice to a poor, ignorant Samana who comes from the jackals in the forest? Dear Kamala, then advise me. Where should I go to find those three things as fast as possible? My friend, many people would like to know that. You must do what you have learned and receive money for it, and clothes and shoes. There is no other way that a pauper can obtain money. What can you do? Mm, I can think. I can wait. I can fast. Nothing else? Nothing. Oh, yes. I can also write poetry. Will you give me a kiss for a poem? That I will do, if I like your poem. How does it go? Siddhartha, after mulling for a moment, recited these verses. Into her shadowy grove came beautiful Kamala. At the entrance stood the brown Samana. Deeply, upon sighting the lotus blossom, he bowed. Smiling, Kamala thanked him. Lovelier, thought the youth. And sacrificing to the gods. Lovelier is sacrificing to beautiful Kamala. Kamala clapped so loudly that her gold bangles rang out. <gasps> beautiful are your verses, Brown Samana, and truly, I will lose nothing by giving you a kiss for them. She drew him over with her eyes. He bent his face to hers and put his lips to the lips that were like a freshly broken fig. Kamala gave him a long kiss, and with deep amazement Siddhartha felt that she was teaching him, that she was wise, that she controlled him, rebuffed him, lured him, and that behind this first kiss there was a long and well-ordered, well-tested series of kisses waiting for him, each different from the next. Breathing deeply, he stood there, and at that moment, he was astonished, like a child at the wealth of knowledge and wisdom opening up before his eyes. Your verses are very beautiful, cried Kamala. If I were rich, I would give you gold pieces for them. But it will be hard for you to obtain the money you need with verses, for you will need a lot of money if you want to become Kamala's friend. You kiss so wonderfully, Kamala, stammered Siddhartha. <laughs> yes, I know how. That is why I have no lack of clothes, shoes, bangles, and all beautiful things. But what will become of you? Are thinking, fasting, and writing poetry all you can do? I also know the sacrificial hymns, said Siddhartha, but I... Do not want to sing them any more. I also know spells, but I no longer wish to cast them. I have read the scriptures. Stop! Kamala broke in. 
You can read and write? Of course I can. Lots of people can. Most cannot. I cannot. It is very good that you can read and write. Very good. And you may also need the spells. At that instant, a maid came dashing in and whispered something into her mistress's ear. I have company, cried Kamala. Hurry and vanish, Siddhartha. No one must see you here. Take note of that. I will see you again tomorrow. She ordered the maid to give the pious Brahmin a white cloak. Without quite knowing what was happening to him, Siddhartha was dragged away by the maid, taken round about to a garden house, given a cloak, led into the bushes, and urgently admonished to vanish immediately without being seen. Content, he did as he was told. Accustomed to the forest, he slipped soundlessly out of the grove and over the hedge. Content, he returned to the town, carrying the rolled-up cloak under his arm. At an inn where travelers were put up, he stood at the door, silently begged for food, silently received a piece of rice cake. Perhaps by tomorrow, he thought, I will no longer beg for food. Suddenly, pride blazed up in him. No longer was he a samana, no longer was it seemly for him to beg. He gave the rice cake to a dog and remained without nourishment. The life they lead in the world here is simple, thought Siddhartha. It has no difficulties. When I was a Samana, everything was hard, arduous, and ultimately hopeless. But now, everything is easy, as easy as the kissing lesson that Kamala gives me. I need clothes and money, nothing else. Those are small, easy goals. They do not spoil your sleep. He had long since tracked down Kamala's townhouse. He went there the next day. Things are going well, she cried. You are expected at the home of Kamaswami. He is the richest merchant in town. If he likes you, he will take you in his service. Be clever, Brown Samana. I have had others tell him about you. Be friendly to him. He is very powerful, but do not be too modest. I do not want you to become his servant. You are to become his peer. Otherwise, I will not be pleased with you. Kamaswami is starting to get old and lazy. If he likes you, he will place a lot of trust in you. Siddhartha thanked her and laughed, and when she found out that he had eaten nothing yesterday or today, she sent for bread and fruit and regaled him. You are lucky, she said as he left. One door after another is opening up for you. Why is that? Do you know magic? Siddhartha said, yesterday I told you that I know how to think, to wait, and to fast. And you felt that these things were useless but they are very useful, Kamala. You will see. You will see that the foolish samanas in the forest learn a lot of lovely things and can do things that you people cannot do. Two days ago, I was an ill-kempt beggar. Yesterday, I already kissed Kamala. And soon, I will be a merchant and have money and all the things you value. Fine, she conceded. But where would you be without me? What would become of you if Kamala were not helping you? Dear Kamala, said Siddhartha, drawing himself up to his full length, when I walked into your grove, I was taking the first step. It was my resolve to learn love from this most beautiful woman. The instant I made that resolve, I also knew that I would carry it out. I knew that you would help me. I knew it the moment you looked at me by the entrance to the grove. But what if I had not wanted to help you? You did want to. Listen, Kamala. If you toss a stone into water, it takes the swiftest way to the bottom. And Siddhartha is like that when he has a goal, makes a resolve. Siddhartha does nothing. He waits. He thinks. He fasts but he passes through the things of the world like the stone through the water, never acting, never stirring. He is drawn. He lets himself drop. His goal draws him, for he lets nothing into his soul that would go against his goal. 
That is what Siddhartha learned among the Samanas. It is what fools call magic and what they think is worked by demons. Nothing is worked by demons. There are no demons. Anyone can work magic. Anyone can reach his goals if he can think, if he can wait, if he can fast. Kamala heard him out. She loved his voice. She loved the look in his eyes. Perhaps, she murmured, it is as you say, my friend. But perhaps it is also that Siddhartha is a handsome man, that women like the look in his eyes, and that is why good fortune comes to you. Siddhartha said goodbye with a kiss. May it be that way, my teacher. May you always like the look in my eye. May good fortune always come to me from you.